Good morning and welcome to the Staffline Group PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. I would now like to hand you over to CEO Albert Ellis. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning and uh, good morning to all of you who've uh, so kindly devoted some of your time. Um, you, you're with Albert Ellis here, the CEO, and Daniel uh, Quint, my CFO. You, many of you will know, know us well by now, so um, we'll go straight into it. Uh, this morning is just a really a pre-closed trading update um, to update the market on last numbers. Really, really important to take that um, to take the opportunity to keep the market informed. Um, hope you appreciate the, the data. There won't be we won't have a very long presentation this morning. Um, just to remind you that you know it's our scale, the staff line and people plus scale that gives it its advantage in the market. Um, as you can see, we're the market leader in blue collar recruitment. Um, we have offices and sites and presence almost anywhere in the UK and Ireland. We've got an increasing presence now in the Republic of Ireland in line with our strategy we announced two years ago. So um, opened a new office last year, um, growing the business in double digits. So, you know, that's a little bit of exposure to the Eurozone and to that hard currency, very welcome and also low tax rates. Um, but in the island of Ireland as a whole, if you take the North and the Republic, um, our market share is growing um, quite tremendously. So very pleased about that. Looking at Scotland, um, actually Scotland's had a very good um, time in the last period, even despite COVID, because their largest clients are in the drinks industry, um, whiskey distillers and others, um, which have obviously not had the impact from COVID that, that other companies have had. And then for the rest of the, the, the south of England and the north, you can see we're, we're, we're tracking the spine of the country, you know, warehouse distribution, logistics, those those those, those sorts of those sorts of sites. So that, that's our that's our um, our group in a nutshell. And now onto the highlights of the statement. Um, you know, the, the last year's numbers. Um, we really feel proud of what we've achieved. It's actually a game of two halves. The first half was um, was tough and challenging because of the the end of the pandemic, the Omicron disruption that we had. We we suffered from um, we suffered from statutory sick pay, um, people, uh, staff not coming into work and customers um, locking down again and closing sites. So that, that was the first half. We were a little bit behind the previous year. And in the second half, we made up all of that, um, all of that, that, that territory. And we'll talk about it in, in the slides to come. So just you, you can see the numbers there. You know, we've grown the business, um, gross profit up, operating profit up in double digits. We, like others, have had a good um, permanent fee uh, uh, year, you know, up 66%. We said a couple of years ago that the permanent fees, um, we'd like to see them in double digits as a proportion of recruitment GB, uh, recruitment G G gross profit, and we're heading for that now. And then finally, um, Daniel's going to talk to you about the cash. Um, really, really, you know, good to go into a challenging year with a strong balance sheet and with a strong cash position. So Daniel will talk about that. And for the rest, um, you know, some, some good news on the trading front, all in all in the statement. J just one one I'll pick up there, and that is the uh, People Plus uh, awarded a, 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 a contract towards the end of the year with the Ministry of Justice. It's a seven year contract with Youth Offending uh, Institutes, and uh, that's a 15 million total contract. So nice little end to the year. Good morning, everyone. Um, very nice to uh, be here today and uh, to present the FY22 trading update. Um, I'm just going to cover the core financials. Um, you'll see that revenue um, was up by 0.4%. Um, there's been two real trends driving that. Um, there's been some softening from the customers who benefited from COVID, um, especially around some of the, the, the supermarkets there. Um, and but specifically online supermarkets and uh, the online environment as, as has been well trailed. But that has been very much offset by, by new wins, um, BMW being one of them, which uh, we spoke about in the year, and Albert will speak a, a bit more about later on. Um, gross profit um, up by 2.3%. 
Um, I would emphasize that actually it's up by more in the recruitment businesses across Great Britain and Ireland, um, with People Plus moving a bit backwards in the very tight labor market that we have, um, where some of our skills training not needed as much uh, as one would have liked. Um, and that's a natural consequence of that. But the recruitment business is really coming to the fore with, uh, with strong gross profit uh, increase. Albert's spoken about those perm fees, that commitment we gave a couple of years ago to increasing staff lines presence in the permanent recruitment market, uh, a real success over the last two years, um, uh, both uh, in our traditional uh, customers who we service in the, in the temporary worker sector, uh, but also in, in other sectors such as defence, for example, obviously um, uh, in a relatively strong environment with what's been going on in Europe in uh, last year uh, in, in, that, in that sector. And over two years, you can see the perm fees have actually gone up 177% um, a new angle on staff line there, but clearly we are predominantly a, a blue collar temporary worker recruiter, but able to benefit off that platform. Um, one thing that's been really pleasing in 2022 is that we've really kept a, a tight control of costs that's enabled the, the profit to drop through. You'll see there the 12.6% growth in underlying operating profit from 21 to 22 and the conversion from gross profit to operating profit up from 12.4% to 13.9%. This has also been supported with the first year of profit recognition um, in the restart contracts that we have, um, and that should continue into next year. So all in all, uh, very pleased with 22. Um, and uh, very importantly, um, just coming on to the next slide, um, is the balance sheet. And in times uh, like we're currently experiencing, more challenging times, um, potentially recessionary times, um, very important to come uh, to be to exist with and certainly come into 2023 with a strong balance sheet. So um, just to point out a couple of points here. So you'll see net cash, um, although down one point nine million pounds, that comes after and you'll see in the top right, a really important point that comes after the repayment of approximately 12 million pounds of COVID government support. Um, and that, there, there are two elements of that support. Uh, it's the last instalment of repaying the deferred VAT, the COVID deferred VAT, five point eight million pounds and then 6.2 million pounds of some advanced payments we received as the Ministry of Justice was supporting um, its supply chain in 2020 and 2021, repaid uh, in 2022. So that's, that, that 1.9 million pounds in, in net cash movement um, is notwithstanding paying that 12 million pounds. It's a really strong underlying trading cash flow performance. So really pleased with that. Net cash at the end of the year, a really good position to be entering 2023 on. Um, and then further to that, that balance sheet strength, and as, I suppose further evidence of that is, is the facilities headroom we have of, of circa £75 million. Pounds. Again, a vast improvement on, on where we were two or three years ago, and um, really actually gives us potential firepower to take advantage of any opportunities that arise in what is going to be a challenging 2023, um, whether we can pick up you know, contracts, etc., um, and we're ready as a business, really focused on, on, on watching that space. Leverage at uh, approximately 0.6 times EBITDA, good position to be in as well. And then finally, just to mention, uh, as a reminder, the group purchased an interest rate cap in Q4 2021, hedging two thirds of our, our exposure to interest rates, or SONIA specifically, um, at 1%. Um, and so we, we really feel that puts the group in a good position all the way through towards the end of 2024, towards the end of the, uh, the, end of that three year interest rate cap product, um, but especially this year, um, leaving us in, in a summary there with, with strength of facilities, covenant strength, and then interest rate protection in, in, in the current environment. So hopefully that's a good platform from which to um, look into 2023 and deal with the, the challenges that will arise, but no doubt the opportunities as well. Albert. Thank you, uh, Daniel. And uh, I must say, and this is, I'm not, this is not a scripted uh, comment, but every CEO needs a CFO who takes out an interest rate cap um, a year before we have a change in prime minister, a change in uh, chance we have an interest rate um, spike by, in the markets as a result. So I'm absolutely delighted with, with Daniel's foresight there. And uh, what, what a pleasure. It protects us from uh, interest rate rises over the next two years, um, which is which is a source of great comfort. Um, anyway, 
Uh, so having said that, um, what we said in at the interims, which was probably the last time you saw us, was that there were four points, four st stepping stones to achieving our FY22 targets. We're very target orientated and we have a culture of high performance in Starfline now. Um, and actually the management team was super motivated to hit the target. I, I know there were some skeptics out in the city that said, look, um, numbers look a bit weak in fir at first half. We understand that in the first half you've had Omicron, you've had costs and unexpected pandemic related setbacks, but you know, this is a tall order in the second half, but we knew that we had the um, the firepower and the and the top and and the stepping stones to get there. So we've just set out how we achieved it, and uh, the, the obvious one was the winning of the contract with BMW Group, that's Mini in Oxford and Rolls Royce in Goodwood, and we onboarded those workers in the second half. Quite a significant amount of cost um, expended to implement that contract. It's a big contract, largest contract awarded um, in our sector, to be honest, in, in recent years. So we didn't want anything to go wrong. Um, we, we, the, the client is foremost in our minds in terms of making sure everything goes smoothly. And then you, Daniel's just set out for, for reminding for reminding anybody that hasn't read that state, particular statement what, what it looks like. And then we had Restart, which was a contract that we flagged in 21, 2021 that we had secured. Um, we, we were the largest subcontractor in, in that particular funding framework um, with three separate contracts. Of course, um, the government at the time felt that, you know, there was a risk of rising unemployment. I mean, some of, some of the forecasts for job losses as a result of the pandemic were, were apocalyptic, to say the least. And Restart was their welfare to work um, successor, uh, the largest amount of, amount of funding, I believe, um, for, for employment, um, certainly in recent times. So we, we, we secured a healthy um, slug of that, that, that funding, but the ramping up and mobilization period lasted 12 months. We successfully did that. And then we promised, as you can see, that we would recognize some profit in that contract if everything went well in the second half. And of course, uh, you can see that that's, 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 that's come in for us. Um, and then, so important and, and very difficult to predict, Starfline traditionally has um, a, a year of, you know, two, two halves, as I said. You have the beginning of the year where it's rather subdued after the previous year's Christmas period. People have got mortgages and um, higher mortgages and, and credit cards uh, and, and everybody's, um, you know, spent, spent their savings a little bit over Christmas. And so the first quarter is always a bit subdued in retail and in the supermarket chains, as you know, if you follow them. Uh, and then the, the, the year begins to move forward and we have, in February, we have uh, Valentine's Day, we have Mother's Day, we have these, these celebrations during the first half, which actually lift trading. We have a summer peak, a mini peak, and then of course, we have the peak um, towards the autumn and into the winter. So we, we knew that the World Cup um, would, would helpfully fuel a little bit of, the, of, of that Christmas peak and we were delighted to see indeed that you all went out um, and bought ready meals and maybe a few beers and, and a couple of bottles of wine and watched the World Cup. So um, that, that really helped us. And of course, it doesn't matter if there's a peak, if, if it really doesn't affect you if you can't deliver. Um, and one of the things that has struck me since I've been at Starfline is how strong the delivery is and how committed our teams are. I've been in the office just before Christmas in the Midlands, one of our busiest offices, and the teams are up, um, you know, five, six o'clock in the morning to fulfill shifts. It's just quite admirable and, and amazing to watch. And so it's that commitment to the delivery that has ensured that we were able to capitalize on the peak. And then finally, um, we, we've seen organic growth. And Daniel has mentioned that logistics and, um, and, and distribution, those sorts of businesses that prospered, um, you know, the sort of, you know, the Amazons of this world, et cetera, that have really prospered during COVID, those businesses that actually uniquely um, could service us while we were all in lockdown globally, that they've actually come off those peaks a little bit. And so therefore demand is slightly lower, but we've seen other organic growth in particular, and I'll talk about that in, in the next slide, give you a little bit of color. Um, so the, the two names I'm, I've chosen are, two of the most fantastic customers in the supermarket and food production chains you could imagine. Um, Sainsbury's Argus, uh, you know, they released some good good trading updates in the last two weeks. 
Um, we, we've been asked to help them. They've, they've, they've given us more market share, and, and we're, we're hugely appreciative of their confidence in us to deliver. And we're helping them with their supply chain. They are, you know, as all companies are now concerned about supply chains. This is one of the one of the great benefits of being listed. Um, of course, you, it, you know, we're transparent, so our numbers, whether they're good or not so good, are always available to the markets. And private companies believe that they have an advantage because they don't have that transparency. Whereas my view is our customers like the transparency. They love to know that we have a strong balance sheet. We will pay the thousands, the tens of thousands of temps that are on their sites on time and, and they can rely on us. And I think that's the Sainsbury story is the confidence in Staffline to stand shoulder to shoulder with them in their supply chain delivery and help them. Now, we've done this through a managed service arrangement. Um, something that we're very, very keen on this year. We believe that more companies will consolidate their man their supply chains, particularly in labor, as some of our weaker competitors will struggle with higher interest rates. Private companies that have got debt and they've, they've got funding, but but those the cost of their funding is rising, particularly if you're not listed. There's a difference there. And then on to Samworth Brothers, which is a, a great friend of ours, and we love Samworth Brothers. They produce... Um, you know, pork pies and they're, they're sort of related food to go, you know, more, I would call it more value um, meals and, and food to go. And of course, they're, they're large customers of the supermarkets, of course. And uh, they're a huge business that actually does a lot of good as well as produce uh, and um, bakery products. But actually, we're one of their largest labor suppliers. And um, they've actually seen a move to value in the, in the, in the supermarket chains. And we, we've picked up um, some organic growth from them. And then just Daniel mentioned restart. You know, it's it's old news now, so I don't want to go through how it works. But essentially, we, we've, we've recognized very cautiously our first profit, e e despite having started that contract 18 months ago. Vinci, to, to just quickly touch on that, it was a contract um, uh, extension and a new element to that contract that we were awarded last year. Um, it, 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 it's to do with the London to Southampton uh, fuel fuel pipe, and of course, um, it, it's construction. It's in the construction sector, and and you know the, these projects, these infrastructure projects, and of course, you you, you won't you'll be forgiven for me for, for me for, if if I could just mention that energy is becoming much more important, and so projects like this and more down the pipeline, which we were engaged on, all to do with energy security and getting fuel into the into the economy, um, I think has been very good for us and is, is good for the country. So we, we, had, we had an outstanding year with Vinci uh, construction. And then, as I said, we, we've implemented BMW in the second half. Now, now finally, um, always looking forward, of course, um, investors want to know what we think of the future. Uh, let, let me just step back by saying, you know, Daniel and I have got 30 years of, more than that, I think 40 years of um, recruitment experience between us. We've certainly been through a number of recessions. Um, my grown up children have, this is their first recession, so I'm helping them navigate it. But, um, you know, we've been, I've been through the 93, the 2001, the, the 2009, um, and then the pandemic. And I can tell you that, that there's only one thing that matters in a recession, and that is your financial strength. Um, and it's and it's binary, you know. If you're strong financially, you've got headroom, you've got um, the confidence of, of lenders that are helping you finance your working capital, and your customers trust you. And there's transparency. Recessions are opportunities for recruitment businesses, um, and so you know it's about keeping that that, um, that that infrastructure in place, keeping your fee earners in place, delivering and navigating your way through. And ultimately, the objective of every recession. Uh, of, uh, for every recruitment business I've been in is to gain more market share. It's the time when you can gain market share and and, and not at the expense so much of price because you, you have a weaker competitive landscape. So uh, macros this year, um, you know, pick whatever whatever number and whatever view and whatever opinion from the various commentators out there, whether it's Ernst and Young, uh, the EY forecast, which is the, the, the recession, you know, they're on the more pessimistic side. Uh, the IMF of got a bit more positive, it, there's a range, but, but let's be honest, it's not going to be as good as last year. And in particular, if you look at the sector, you'll have seen that both Page and Walters have had profit warnings for last year, and Hayes had an inline um, just a week ago. So the sector 
it is now either in line or warning on, 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 on the outlook. So I think, you know, the first point to note is we're a big recruitment company and we can't be immune to the sector wide um, weaknesses. And it's particularly in permanent recruitment. There's a cycle. Customers have now, you know, hired many, many perms. And uh, now that the demand falls and the first thing they do is they start um, thinning out the workforce, as you've seen with all of the big tech companies. Um, they're all laying off IT software developers, who would have thought? Um, and, and that's the first element. And of course, everything's a cycle. And so within six to 12 months, or you know, these companies would have laid off too many people or they'd have thinned the, works, the workforce, and suddenly demand will start picking up and actually the economy will improve and they'll need people. And in particular, in the blue collar sector, it'll be supermarkets that, that will need to hire temps, that they will turn to us to to, to for temps and, and the retail, um, aviation and automotive sectors as well. So we, we, whilst we're not immune, we really believe we've got a key strength of resilience. We all need to eat, people are traveling, um, cars need to be replaced, vehicles need to be replaced, and, and, uh, and, and these are just the basics of life and they don't stop during a recession. Demand might fall, and of course, people might change their choices, but overall, the, 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 the economy continues, continues to move forward. So that's recruitment. Now, onto People Plus. Um, well, it's a, it's a yin and yang, because People Plus's um, great strength is that they are you know, a trusted partner for the DWP, the Department of Working Pensions, um, the Education Department, and the Ministry of Justice, well known to the commissioners, and they and their job is to support unemployed um, those those people un, unfortunate enough to be unemployed at this time. And People Plus is 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 there for them now um, because the jobs market has actually surprised everybody on the strength of vacancies, and you know we just hit record low unemployment um, in the last few months. Now th there's a lot in those numbers. There's a lot of inactivity. And there are people that have left the workforce, retired earlier during the pandemic. And of course, we've got a long term sickness problem in, in, in the economy from the pandemic as a result of the pandemic. But actually, of those people choosing to work, wanting to work and in the and in the workforce, we're at a record low unemployment. And that, of course, um, is not helpful for People Plus because, you know, People Plus generates its revenue from helping volumes of unemployed individuals. So um, because of the, the restart and the, and, and the um, training, training programs, having less volume than we expected, and we don't think that unemployment is going to get materially worse in the next six months, we've held the, our expectations back on People Plus. We've simply, as a board, been very, very cautious, mature, responsible, and said, we're not going to make a highly optimistic and possibly unrealistic um, uh, for, uh, uh, forecast and, and statements about the future. We'll rather look at the near term, be, be mature, be, be take, 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 take a, a cautious approach and, um, and, and address the near term factors as we see them. So th th that's the macroeconomic backdrop. And of course, you know, the global backdrop in terms of automotive, supply chains, travel, you know, th this will be effective, but I think less so than what we've seen with People Plus. So People Plus is where our outlook is most cautious. Um, but we have a healthy pipeline of opportunity. We can't talk about it right now um, because obviously, you know, pens need to be taken and, and signatures appended to contracts and we need certainty, but we've got a good, healthy pipeline of new opportunities. And I think we'll be in a much, much better position as well as we secure those opportunities with our balance sheet and with our results lost uh, from FY22. Um, of course, it goes without saying that not only Daniel and I are not, only, not the only members of the management team, but we've got a fantastic management team out there. Um, you know, all of the hidden unsung heroes that are delivering on the front line, our management, our MDs, our FDs, they're all working to make sure that we collect our cash, that we actually invoice our debtors, that we actually make good decisions and that we, we do what it says on the turn that we do and we, may, and we are successful. So a credit to the management team, but also to the staff. Um, look, the group remains well, well placed. There's no doubt about it. Um, we've got a strong balance sheet. We can serve in cash. That was the right decision. Um, to, I mean, I remember facing um, you, the investors a year ago and talking about dividends and other things. You know, we said we need to conserve our cash and build our balance sheets. 
Um, that's what our key larger investors also wanted us to do. And we've done that and they've been proven right in that. So, you know, conserving our cash, using it to capitalize on, on considerable market opportunities. And we'll update you as and when those opportunities um, appear. And, and of course, ultimately, the game is to further entrench our market position and grow our market leading share of that of that market. So with that, Daniel, I don't know if you've got any other comments. Um, yeah, no, I just uh, would support everything that Albert said, obviously. Um, challenging year ahead, um, uh, you know, off the back of a really good 22, FY22. Challenging year ahead, cautious forecast, but opportunities are, are there and we're ready for when they present themselves and, and we're able to realise them. Um, so with that, we'll finish the presentations and we're we'll, we'll ready to take some questions. Perfect, Albert and Daniel, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the top right corner of your screen. While the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Albert, Daniel, as you can see, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation and thank you to all investors for submitting their questions. Albert, could I ask you to read out the questions and give responses where appropriate to do so and I'll pick up from you at the end. Thank you. So I, th I think I'll take the, uh, the first question, which was how much debt is left to be paid? Why is such a big firm share price going so low? So in terms of the first part A of that question, uh, really two questions, <clears throat> um, there's no debt uh, in terms of COVID debt which that question might be referring to, to be repaid, that's all, that's all completed. Um, uh, if it's a more general question, if you look at our year end position, we ended up with net cash. So uh, I think that really leaves the uh, business in a, in a really good place. Um, why is such a big firm share price going so low? I think, uh, as you would have seen, uh, driven by the recruitment sector, our share price is uh, not dissimilar to the share prices of, uh, you know, three, four, five, five other in, in, our, in our category. Um, along with as you've as we've gone through the end of 22 into early 23, um, the macroeconomics obviously have uh, spoken and people have taken their direction from that reality. Um, uh, that's that's the reading I have into uh, into the reason why the the share price has gone lower. Um, just the next question because I, I will take obviously the finance related ones. I think this one looks like a finance one. What is the repayment of 6.2 million of COVID related advance payments to the Ministry of Justice? It sounds like MOG paid up front for services that weren't delivered, required, so these didn't convert to sell. So um, as I mentioned, just to, just to echo what I said earlier, in the depths of COVID, so we're talking throughout 2020 and then in 2021, the Ministry of Justice wanted to make sure that their supply chain was robust. There were no risks to delivery of service. That was absolutely key. Uh, as was the case in other parts of, of the economy. Um, and that was the reason why uh, those advanced payments, as I call them, were made. Um, absolutely appropriate, uh, all paid back on time. Um, um, but it was, to be to summarise, very important to ensure that the strengths of the supply chain um, to society, um, to, to whom those services are supplied, whether it's prisons, et cetera, were robust and strong and wouldn't fall over. And, and now we weren't in a position that, took, but that was a general approach they took to the supply chain. There might be some other smaller suppliers who might have been at risk of challenges and in terms of financial challenges um, with cash flows. But uh, that was the general strategic reason for that. And they did uh, convert into sales. Yes. Um, broker forecast for FY23 of turnover increasing marginally and EPS growing 22%. Is your cautious approach to FY 2023 in line with these forecasts or management expectations different? Daniel? Yeah, well, I think, I think what we'll say about FY 23 is that, um, is that uh, the results for 23, as we see them at the moment, uh, right, right uh, you know, in January, at the beginning of the year, we see them being slightly behind FY 22. Um, and, I, and I think, as we've said, we're, we're approaching things in a cautious manner. Um, and so our expectations are that we will be slightly behind 22. Um, but we will obviously, as Albert said, we will update our next opportunity for update is on Tuesday, the 21st of March, as you would have seen announced this morning, which will be the, the full publication of our FY22 results. 
and then at other points during the year. So we'll update at those points. Changing revenue mix from permanent to temporary recruitment suggests to us that margins will come under pressure. Is this correct, Daniel? Yeah, I think I think that's an interesting point. As as we um, stated in our presentation, we've increased perm fee sixty five percent over the last year and over the two year period one hundred seventy seven percent. I think so. The general comment about perm recruitment softening would lead one to believe uh, that is possible. Number two, I would make sure I, I would say that it depends uh, where our mix lies in temporary recruitment. So, for example, we've spoken about as the image on the front of our presentation suggests that we are have made inroads into the aviation sector which has slightly higher margins than you would expect for example in the supermarket sector so that would be able to support our margins um, and the final thing i would say just back on the permanent recruitment uh, point is that the uh, sectors that we uh, in addition to supplementing our temporary customers which are quite focused around the food supply chain and, and food retail we do have quite uh, an extensive presence in uh, technical engineering permanent sectors, for example, defence. And I think I mentioned that and um, obviously, sadly, with the war, but for, for business reasons, those would be supportive of the margin. So I think we'll just have to wait to see how the mix of margins turns out um, with the, the offsetting of some of the softening in, 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 um, in permanent recruitment with where our actual permanent recruitment ends up in the defence sector and oil and gas um, uh, where we where we can support those sectors. So um, all to play for, um, um, but we were watching that closely. I, uh, I'll just add to that. I don't think we're going to see any sort of alarming margin degradation, if, if degradation, if that's uh, also part of the sort of thinking behind that question. I think they will be what they'll be, but certainly on conversion ratios, um, we've seen through the good work of the transformation and everybody that has been involved in turning this company around, our conversion ratios have gone up right across the board. Um, I will I will just bring out Ireland in that. Um, they've done, that team has done a fantastic job. Uh, that they've got they've got sets of beating conversion ratios in in the mid twenties. Um, really, so someone who comes from the recruitment business that, that that's really a fantastic margin. So you know we've got some great margins. Uh, conversion ratios mainly, which shows efficiencies. Daniel's been talking about clients, which is absolutely right. And uh, we, we just don't see any any reason that there would be any alarm about about the macro on margins. Um, you, you've asked, I know the company has been focused on organic growth, but do you see a return to making acquisitions? As I said, we are actually conserving cash. We are keeping. We, we see organic growth as a sort of. It, it's always the best the best growth, right? It's the most valuable for shareholders. Um, Staffline have made some acquisitions in the past. Some have been good. Some have been not so good. Um, we, 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 we can get more out of what we've got um, is, is in our view. But we, we will not be um, closed, our minds will not be closed to the possibility of picking things up that are either um, distressed sellers and are in our market or, or where there's value to be had. But, but we're not going to bet the farm whilst Daniel and I, the executive team here, there'll be, there'll be no borrowings to buy acquisitions. You, 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 can, you, can, you, can you can take that to the bank. Um, it'll all be out of trading cash flow if there are any bolt-ons. And actually, our organic growth opportunity is our real opportunity. Excellent. Next question. Is your rate of cash collection from customers now at an acceptable level? Or are you still working hard to improve data days? We're always working hard to improve data days. And I'll choose this opportunity to applaud uh, our teams, uh, especially in the credit control teams and the FDs who've done a, a fantastic job at the throughout 22 and continue to do that, not just at, at, at a certain moment, but throughout the year, do a fantastic job. So we're always working hard to improve data days. It is harder than it was two, three years ago when I started, naturally. There was uh, some really good opportunities then, but we continue to work hard. Uh, and we'll drive data days um, to make the, the cash flow as efficient as possible for the business. Just just adding my congratulations to the to the finance team. They've done a fantastic job on on data days. We, we really have sector sector best in class data days. So well done to the finance team on that. Uh, Tom has asked, how do you feel Starfine is performing compared to its peer group? Um, look, uh, the peer group is not the white collar recruiters. Um, actually, there's elements of staff line that reflect, uh, you know, the same markets that Hayes, Walters and Page are in um, and Gattaca. 
And, and those businesses, you know, tremendous businesses like Datum RPO, for example, had a record year last year. Um, Omega, our business that's in the technical and engineering sectors, you know, very much in, you know, in, in helping the supply chains in automotive and also, um, and, and, you know, the defense sectors. These, these businesses have been booming and continuing to be strong. So, um, you know, in, in that respect, I feel that we're, we're standing shoulder to shoulder with the best in the sector. But on the blue collar side, um, you know, we don't have any obvious uh, listed competitors, certainly in the UK, where it's their core business. But we know from our own intel and from our, our interaction in the market, particularly with the other private private companies, that, that, that we're outperforming. Um, and so we, we feel that we're in a very, very good position there. Good, thank you. Um, next question, does the managed service contract with Sainsbury's mean that UK temporary staff and cover the working capital outflow? If so, how quickly does Sainsbury's pay you uh, without obviously uh, prejudicing any commercial relationships? Um, the uh, supply chain cash flow uh, stream that occurs in that contract is protected um, for staff line in terms of, of payments um, down to our supply chain, the, the panel of agencies. So there's nothing to worry there. Um, I will just say that um, the, the staff line's cash position is protected appropriately. So next question, as an indication of scale, fixed rate debt facilities compatible with your covenants together with cash exceed the entire market capitalization of staff line. Would you consider modest share buybacks and or a dividend? Um, <clears throat> so um, I think well spotted that we're, we're in a strong balance sheet position. Um, we will, uh, and, and obviously we have the challenging macros of 2023, but as we go through this year, we will certainly be considering, and, and, and their position allows the board to consider um, those options, um, not only dividends at a point in time, but certainly buybacks. I think that's a, a strong consideration that the board will give to that. Yeah. I mean, where we have excess cash, we, we as a board have a responsibility to, to um, consider there are options in, in relation to our owners and, share, and shareholders, of which Daniel and I are, you know, are, are big investors in the company. And so, um, you know, be assured that we will always be considering that. But it's weighed against the, you know, this, the near term and the, and, 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 and the, you know, the requirements and our strategic objective to conserve our balance sheet. So th th these sort of competing, competing <coughs> considerations will be properly debated on our board and are being properly debated. But as, da as Daniel said, we're in a much better position now to consider and debate them than we were a year or two years ago. Good, thank you, Albert. Uh, next question, how much debt is left? Bit of an echo of the first question. Uh, we had net cash position at the end of the year. For purposes of transparency, as you would have seen at the half year, so we do have movements in debt throughout the year. Uh, the course of the year end, comparing it to the prior year end is a, is a very uh, sensible uh, and, and legitimate benchmark. So you can see the improvements we've made. So even though we had the 1.9 reduction in net cash, that was having also paid out that 12 million of final COVID uh, payments back, uh, back, uh, paying them back. Um, so um, yeah, the net cash, net debt number fluctuates from day to day, depending on invoices, but the reality is at the end of the year, we had net cash. That's a, a good position to be in. I just wanted to add that um, very important point here in recruitment, we, 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 we need working capital. So we, we've got, you know, 35,000, Temps that we have to pay every week, and we need working capital. We need to hit those pay, pay, payroll deadlines absolutely in accordance with our commitments to our customers and our very important temps and staff. So that's really important. We need, you know, a, an overdraft, if you like, to help us do that, but it fluctuates up and down. Um, we don't have any, any, any core debt any longer, and we don't owe the, the government or the HMRC Treasury any any liabilities over COVID. So we have no core debt. In other words, we don't have a mortgage. We have what I call working capital facilities, what Daniel and I call working capital facilities. We use our debtors, which is our asset, to finance that so we can pay our, our contractors in the case of Omega and our, and our temporary staff in the case of Staffline. And that's just simply to meet payroll obligations and someone rightly pointed out there's a gap between our payroll and when Sainsbury's or Tesco's or someone else would pay us, and that gap needs to be financed. Um, so just to make sure that you understand that, it's an important point. 
dividend question. Um, a dividend question again, will you be considering dividends given shareholders' loyalty and capital raise of 50p? Absolutely feel that for you on that one. Uh, Daniel, as well as I, contributed as, you know, a material part of our net wealth to the, to the capital raise. Um, first of all, our objective is to make sure that we're in an even better position than we expect it to be, um, which I think, you know, to, in terms of our balance sheets and our market positioning, I, I sense that we are in that in a much better position, certainly from a market share and a turnover and, and a position, position we are. Um, in terms of dividends, though, it, it, it's, we, we have to have that conversation as we previously discussed between what form of um, returns we, 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 we choose. Um, there's buybacks, there's dividends and, and, and specials and, and various other things. So, so look, we'll, we'll take that debate, but we, we, we're, not, we're, not, we're not at liberty to give you any, any commitments right now. We're at the beginning of a difficult year for the world, indeed for the UK, and um, you know, our, our focus is really on delivering for you and our share price and must reflect that. We'd like to see some movement on that. That would be my personal um, desire. Uh, government contracts have always had the disadvantage of being relatively lumpy and unpredictable. You're absolutely right. But risks seem to have increased further in recent years. Would you consider disposal of people plus if you received a suitable offer? Uh, that's a tricky one as a public company to comment on. Uh, we, we, we can't comment on those sorts of, um, those sorts of uh, M&A &A possibities until we've made a decision or, 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 or we've received, received an offer. But what I can say to you is, look, Government money is also very, very good quality money. When you're delivering, you're a good partner. It is lumpy. And this year, you're absolutely right. We're going through um, a cycle where commissioning and new contracts are at lower levels than they were um, in the recent past because the government have actually put a lot of money into, into the likes of post-COVID programs. But, but those commissioning levels will improve um, and increase because there's a cycle the government has to renew its, its commitments, whether it's prisons, whether it's education, whether it's employability. So I wouldn't get too concerned about it. Um, in, in the main, uh, all business are really cyclical and government's no different. But government earnings is really good quality. First of all, you know that the, the, your debtor is secure. And uh, secondly, um, if you deliver, you know that the revenues uh, will be there as well. When will share prices recover? A million dollar question. Um, all I can say is that usually in the in darkest before the, morn, the, the morning and the day breaking, um, in all recessions, uh, I remember the, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the fear that that, that created around the world that banks were, 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 were collapsing. Global names were actually failing. And actually, if you look back, um, if you had invested in the recruitment sector at that time and not had fear but had faith, you would have made, you know, multiple times what you would have invested. So as Warren Buffett says, um, when everybody else is fearful, um, that's when he's brave. And he gets very fearful when everybody's when everybody's um, exuberant. So, you know, think counter cyclically. Um, share, you know, share prices are down. Well, that's a buying opportunity. Share prices rise. Well, that's also good because you're in, your portfolio shows improvement. Henry Spain Investment Services is your largest shareholder. Are they actively engaged with your board? I'm delighted to say that both Henry Spain and HRNet and our other shareholders, um, Fidelity, I might mention Fidelity, we're very engaged with, and others. Um, we're engaged with them all. Very, very, you know, uh, Aberdeen Standard Life. I had some good catch-ups just before Christmas. Um, we're constantly engaged with, 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 our, with our investors, and it's really important to us, Henry Spain being one, of a number of investors. And so very engaged with our investors. We're all investment minded. We're all shareholders. Um, Tom Spain, who, who's the founder of that business, is actually our interim chair, is taking care of, um, of, of the chair, chair role as we evolve the board composition. Um, we're making some appointments to the board, um, in particular audit committee chair this in, in the first, second quarter of this year. And so our board composition will continue to evolve. So. Lots of engagement, lots of support from our shells, and we really appreciate it. Um, next question. Daniel stated the drop in share price reflects other drops seen by other recruitments. Page Hayes and Walters are flat over the last six months. Staff line is down 29%. This was suggested it's not sector driven. Why do you think the share price is down 29% when others are flat? Well, my comments were made over probably a 12 month period as opposed to a six month period. 
Um, I think there'll be different factors that will affect different types of recruitment company, um, difference between blue collar and, 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 and white collar. Um, so I, I think picking a, a particular, I was talking in, a, in, the gen, in general terms, I've seen uh, you know, those share prices drop over 12 months at, at 50%. Um, not hugely different to to star flying, um, and so I think I think that's a, a relatively fair, legitimate uh, benchmark. But point taken over different periods of time. Never want to shy away from uh, those kind of challenges. Uh, what, what, one of yeah, one of the one of the drivers of share price. And look, I'm not a broker. I'm a chief executive. But uh, one of the drivers of share price is the size of the market cap. So um, aimless to businesses who are smaller have suffered more than FTSE. So you know you know the FTSE 100 is um, touching record highs, um, certainly in sterling terms. So, um, you know, that, that's oil, banks, gas, energy, um, telecoms companies, insurers, you know, they, they, they are large global financial and energy companies, telecoms companies that is driving that. Smaller companies, um, and particularly the AIM index has um, underperformed there, but that's always the same. Start, uh, small companies suffer from more illiquid, illiquid stocks, but of course, you know when they recover, the growth is higher, and the and the, the smaller funds outperform the FTSE trackers. So it, it's really just what your personal investment taste um, is catered to. So that I, w- I wouldn't get into too much um, detail on share prices. That that's for the market. But those are my own comments. Um, I've always been a fan of small companies. As you know, one of our one of our close friends, Gervais Williams at Mike and Group, talks about the great strengths of UK small caps, um, and so you know I've been a fan. But of course, the cycles of share prices are different, uh, depending on the sector, depending on the scale, and depending on the liquidity. Ah, oh, it is an interesting one. How has Albert Ellis managed his commitments given his role in other boards outside of Star Fund? Well, I actually only have. Um, one um one 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 ball position that's at hr net group in singapore um uh, because of the time zone actually any involvement i have is usually at, at an ungodly hour in the morning um because those board meetings will will start around about midday singapore time which is sort of um it's three four o'clock in the morning here they they, they have um it's a very very um tight schedule that it doesn't impact my my role whatsoever in fact it's um it's a tremendous uh, business, HR Net Group, and my role there is really to learn um, how they achieve the most outstanding sort of margins and growth that they have achieved. So, so that, that that's and I'm there to help them in, in my with my experience, and and so it's very limited time commitment. I'm on no committees in that board, and we have about four board meetings a year. Um, I've 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 resigned from. I've come to the end of my commitment with Asia House. Um, I need to update my LinkedIn on that basis because that was the 31st of December. So I'm a little bit overdue on that. So as a, as a consequence, I, I was um, I certainly wouldn't want to do uh, more than one role outside of Staffline. Um, and then my other commitments are really sort of um, they're, they're, there's no time time whatsoever. Um, and and so th- th- those are the only positions I have. The two positions I have. Major House and HR Net Major House are, are finished, so it's only one. So I think that 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 was a good question. Thank you, um, and gave, gives me an opportunity to address that. I'm 150% involved in Starfly, and it's seven days a week job, but it's the best job I've ever had, and I'm absolutely loving it. Great, thank you very much to everyone for for listening, and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for your questions, and thank you for your time. Albert, Daniel, thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you will now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Staffline Group PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. Good morning to you all.